Okay, I am in no way uh, retconning my previous opinion of Batman Returns. Although I am saying that I'm sorry for calling Batman Returns my least favorite of the of the uh, Batman, the original Batman series. Clearly, Batman Forever is worse, and you know there there are a lot of reasons why. I I like like uh, like all of my reviews will try to provide reasons, but you know. Batman Forever is the first Batman movie in this series not directed by Tim Burton and also not starring Michael Keaton. <clears throat> and uh, instead, Batman is played by Val Kilmer and he is combating two villains this time uh, the Riddler and Two Face. Last time it was Penguin and Catwoman, this time it's the Riddler, played by Jim Carrey and Two-Face played by Tommy Lee Jones, despite the fact that Billy D. Williams played Two-Face in the first Tim Burton movie. Um, however, he is getting some help in the form of Chris O'Donnell as as Robin, who is, uh, who is Dick Grayson, secretly Dick Grayson, a, uh, a circus performer whose family was uh, killed by Two-Face um, in his search for Batman. In addition, there is a new love in Bruce Wayne's life in the form of Dr. Chase Meridian, uh, who is, I believe, a, crim a uh, criminal psychologist. She, wor she works in the field of psychology, is what is what we're saying. And she may have, and she has both a clinical and a sexual interest in Batman. So, with all these with all these things going on, oh, and the Riddler apparently wants to sap the brain power of the entire city by by. Uh, by putting what he calls the box on every home com on every home television in Gotham City, and basically what it, what it will do is it will give people the illusion that they are watching some new innovative 3D technology, but in reality their brains will be will be uh, getting will be getting drained and going into the Riddler's brain. Uh, it's yeah, this movie is very stupid. It's, and honestly, it has not aged well. A lot of the time, I remember some good scenes about this movie, but the overall finished package is not very good. I mean, it's cluttered. It's, it kind of has the same problem, some of the same problems as Batman Returns, although I will say this, Batman gets more screen time than he did in Batman Returns. Um, they at least tried to, uh, in fact, this, this just might be the most screen time they've ever given Batman in these old movies. Um, it's between this and the first one. Although I think he may get more screen time here. Batman slash Bruce Wayne may get more screen time here. I think there's more, there's more screen time devoted to his, uh, to his origin story and, and you know, why he's doing what he's doing here than I think the other movies did. <clears throat> so that's that's positive, and you know Val Kilmer as as Batman. Some people have a problem with him as Batman. I don't. I mean, he wouldn't have been my first choice, but you know he's he's got he's got a fair amount of screen presence. He's uh, he's not really good looking enough to be Bruce Wayne. I don't think. Um. But but he handles the uh, the intrigue and the and the mysterious side of the character pretty well. As Batman, he's despite the fact um, despite the fact that uh, he's he still seems kind of uh, hampered by the by the suit. He he's fine as Batman. He doesn't really get a whole lot to do. He's not very intimidating. Although this movie does not go for an intimidating Batman. This almost seems actually no. This does seem like a completely different animal from from the two Tim Burton movies because the two Tim Burton movies if they were stylish they were dark they they had this very gothic uh has they had this very gothic aesthetic now Gotham City and the Joel Schumacher in the Joel Schumacher Batman movies are are just this it's just this uh, big neon light show it looks like it honestly looks like uh uh Tokyo an americanized version of Tokyo um 
with, with a bunch of statues and, and whatnot. It's it's odd how different Gotham City looks, and I guess you could argue that's a good thing because Schumacher may not have necessarily wanted to uh, to repeat what Tim Burton did or try to top him in the in the uh, style, which was probably a smart thing because Tim Burton style is typically what he does best. Um, <clears throat> Chris O'Donnell's Robin. This has a uh, I know this has probably gotten some uh, some questions from from fans because you know Dick Grayson he was not nearly as uh, as angsty as they play him here, but you know he's he's lost his parents in a circus and he's and he's uh, overcome with this feeling of uh, of vengeance. So and the way that they kind of try to tie that in with with uh, Batman's story for vengeance and how he's having doubts about his willingness to continue donning the cowl, donning the cape and cowl, I thought that was, I thought that was a really clever thing to do. Um, and I, and I think it's appropriate that they, that they try to tie these two, two characters together because, because this whole kindred spirit dynamic is primarily what motivates them to become partners. Um, some of the, some of the dialogue between them gets pretty repetitive. I mean, I think Chris O'Donnell toward the end kind of descends into, you know, you, know, <laughs> you can't stop me. He kind of descends into that petulant kid, like, I'm going to do this and you can't stop me. Um, but to his credit, he's, uh, to his credit, he's a lot more, I can buy Robin dramatically in this more than I could the Burt Ward version. I mean, this, this Robin, this Robin, I think, is... I don't see how that they how they could have gotten much better in a movie like this, which which is already pretty silly. <clears throat> However, that being said, this movie has this movie has a serious problem in tone. Sometimes it really wants to be this dark, somber um, character study of Batman, which I think is where the movie shines. And other times it wants to focus on these really silly villains, which the villains, by the way, are so irritating in this movie. I could not stand the two the two bad guys. Jim Carrey is the Riddler. You know, this was the time when this was the time in the nineties when Jim Carrey was just on top of the world. Ace Ventura, The Mask, all these all these hits that he was having, he was being hailed as this he was being hailed as this uh, this comedic god. And so they cast him as the Riddler. Not because of any merit, but because it's Jim Carrey. He's in everything. Let's, let's cast him as the Riddler, and he basically plays this very... He's more cartoonish than the Frank Gorshin Riddler from the 1960s Batman show. Which makes no sense, because you know how... You know Danny DeVito was kind of playing a darker version of Burgess Meredith? Jim Carrey is just completely over the top, and I think, and I think that's what I usually have a problem with when it comes to Carrie is because is that he is just so over the top and he makes all these weird faces without without seemingly any rhyme or reason and that does not change here he is just so ridiculous in this movie um, his costumes are ridiculous his mannerisms are ridiculous I mean he I mean the the positions that he gets his body into the the way that he kind of stretches his face and makes all these exaggerated expressions uh, it works for something like the mask, but for the Riddler, honestly, it just seems it just seems like Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey. And I'm sorry, that's not the Riddler. I could not buy this guy as a genius or or as someone that anyone would hire for for any kind of uh, high-ranking position at Wayne Enterprises. He comes across as a crackpot. He is just so transparent. Um, and then we have Tommy Lee Jones as Two Face, who's not very good either. He's not as irritating as Jim Carrey, but he comes close. A lot of the time, this is not Two Face. Okay, this is not Two Face. <sighs> he just spends so much time. Both of these guys are basically Joker knockoffs. And by Joker knockoffs, I don't mean the really cool, dark Joker. I mean the, the original 60s Cesar Romero Joker, except, again, more over the top. T 
Tommy Lee Jones spends much of his time as Two-Face laughing and going along with whatever the Riddler tells him to do. So neither of the villains are very good. They're not menacing. They're not, uh, they're not entertaining to watch, in my opinion. Um, Tommy Lee Jones gives probably one of the worst performances of his career, in my opinion. Um, but you know, he's given tons of great, of other great performances, so I get, so I guess I, I prefer to consider this an unfortunate aberration in his career. Uh, yeah, they, they don't really have much in the way of motivation either, because, because, uh, the whole reason why, why Edward Nigma becomes the Riddler is because, is because apparently Bruce Wayne shot him down, even shot his uh, research down even though even though he didn't he didn't completely shoot it down until you pushed him you idiot so, because basically Edward Nigma is is pitching his his box idea to Bruce Wayne um, and Bruce Wayne is is like a is like okay well let, let me think about it uh, send the send the schematics and stuff to to uh, to Barbara and we and I will give you a call. And for no reason at all, for no foreseeable reason, Edward Nigma is like, no, I need an answer now. I think I deserve it. So, okay. Of course Bruce Wayne says no. And he gives a legitimate reason for saying no. He gives a perfectly ethical reason for saying no. Tampering with people's brain waves, it's, it raises too many questions. And somehow, Instead of just taking Bruce Wayne up on his offer to discuss it further and, you know, send him schematics and and possibly have a shot at at uh, getting getting your research funded and, and getting approved for human trials, you'll probably still be turned down because, again, tampering with brain waves, it's, it's just unheard of, but you may be able to use it on chimps. Although that kind of brings me to Rise of the Planet of the Apes, which is a much better movie. Um, I digress. Uh, so yeah, his motivation doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, and Two-Face, we never really learned why Two-Face wants to kill Batman. You could argue that, oh, well, Batman failed to save him from the, from the acid that damaged half of his face, but we never really get any indication of that. All we get is, is a video showing Batman trying to save Two-Face. If anything, shouldn't Two-Face be going after the guy who, who damaged his face? Why does he want to kill Batman? Immediately, we were we are thrown into this movie with with Two Face being all evil and and saying like, "Oh, I'm going to set a trap for Batman." <laughs> and I and I said, "Why? Why? Explain." The villains are not very good. Um, you know, some of the minor players like Michael Goff and Pat Engel. Pat Engel's still not very interesting as Commissioner Gordon, but he gets the job done, and and Michael Goff is still is still reliably likable as Alfred. Um, and thankfully, he gets more material to work with here than he did in Batman Returns. But but again, Batman Returns was a, a movie that was overall better made than this. Um, I think it was more fitting to the Batman character. The script was horrible, but well, this I I can't really say all horrible. It was, it was really just a mess. But, uh, this, this one though, it goes back to what I was saying about the tone. The movie needs to pick a tone. You can't have it both ways. You can't have this really dark and serious, uh, character study that, uh, that, that kind of hinges on the drama of Batman in one scene, and then immediately go over to the Riddler and Two-Face doing their over-the-top cartoonish uh, scene. It's, it just doesn't work. I mean, it honestly makes for a kind of unpleasant viewing experience. And then tying all that in with, with the death of Robin's family and trying him trying to cope with that, it actually gave me kind of tonal whiplash. I said, what am I supposed to feel during this movie? These elements never really mesh as well as I think the creators of this movie wanted them to. Um, and the fact that they get some of the, the fact that they get some of the characters wrong doesn't really help either. Because, uh, like I said, this is not the Riddler, and this is not Two Face, and the Riddler has always been a pretty tough villain to to nail. Um, because he, you could easily make him just a Joker 
clone. But, you know, again, I digress. <sighs> the action scenes are are fine. You still get the sense that the actor is hampered by the, by the rubber suit, which they actually come out and say, Oh, black rubber. Instead of body armor like it was in the first one, they say it's black rubber here. Um, I will say this. Kilmer's movements don't look as stilted in the Batman suit as Keaton's, as Keaton's movements did. But overall, Keaton was a better Batman than Kilmer, although Kilmer does an admirable job both in the physical aspects and the uh, and the and the dramatic aspects. But overall, I I just didn't enjoy this movie. Like I said, the tone is all over the place. Um, it has some high points, like I said, with the uh, with with you know trying to set up Robin as this uh, as this damaged and and uh, emotionally distraught character and, and you know setting Batman up with a psychologist which that is a brilliant idea right there setting Batman up with a psychologist as as the love interest that is a brilliant idea that they never really take advantage of that's so even one of their good ideas one of the good points of this movie is not nearly as good as it could have been you get some lines of dialogue um, of you know Bruce Wayne telling telling Dr. Chase Meridian of uh, of his past and and Chase said these are repressed memories. So, so you get some, you get some of what it could be. But you know, can you imagine how interesting this movie would have been if, if uh, Doctor, if Doctor Meridian, Nicole Kidman's character was, if there was actually some, some ambiguity as to what exactly her interest in Batman was, if it was clinical or sexual. Here, there is absolutely no question. That it is purely sexual. Again, this much this would have been a much more fascinating and thought-provoking movie if it if there if there was a question of why exactly is she interested in Batman? Because whenever she interacts with Batman, she doesn't really ask him any any psychological questions. I understand not being able to ask him questions in uh, in the middle of a crowd when when he's in the middle of, of a fight scene after having rescued her but you know when she gets him alone uh, there's there's not really much in the way of uh, of analysis that you're doing lady and Nicole Kidman as looking like a looking like a supermodel in this in this movie instead of like, instead of what she's supposed to be a psychologist um, yeah, I just, I just really didn't enjoy this movie, and I honestly think Joel Schumacher was the wrong guy to pick up the reins of Batman. I'm, I'm sure, and I know for a fact that I am not the only person who thinks that after what comes next. But yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's not very good. Batman Forever. I still don't understand the title. Um, <clears throat> some some bright aspects, but overall just not as well made as the previous two. And again, if you remember my reviews of the previous two, then I... I, I did not think that those were any kind of uh, masterpieces, but they were at least better than this. They at least got the character more. They at least did not take a step backward. Um, they at least had a consistent tone, so... Again, I don't really know what else I can say. I can imagine this movie sucking for I can imagine this movie sucking forever. So I guess that's something.